Welcome to Spotlight on Broadway. I'm Pat Collins, and my guest is a true Renaissance man, producer, author, actor, and a Tony-winning director, Kenny Leon. Welcome. You're a busy guy these days, aren't you? It's good to be busy. It's, it's good to be busy. I mentioned the Tony-winning director because that links us to Raisin in the Sun. Absolutely. which is a, a, a powerful play with Mr. Denzel. Uh, was he easy to convince? Did he want to do this play? Or? Well, you know, first, <laughs> off, first off, I, uh, I had the pleasure of doing that play twice. And first time I did it with Sean Combs, and then this time I did it with Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. Denzel and I first did uh, Fences on Broadway in 2010. With Viola Davis. Right. With wonderful and Stephen Viola McKinley Henderson. Mm, yes. Wonderful mm. group of people, mm. you know. That, that sort of production sort of directed itself with uh, talent like that. Yes. But uh, at that time, Denzel and I had a great time working together. And he said, look, I want to come back, you know, every three or four years to do a play. So that's why we knew we were working toward a Raisin in the Sun after Fences. We didn't know it was going to be a Raisin in the Sun, but we knew we were going to do another Broadway play. And then when the time neared, about a year out, we started talking about it, and then we started talking about plays. And at that time, it was important for him to do something from an African-American canon. Right. And then it was actually his idea to say, you know, I, I know you did a Raisin in the Sun, like, but that was like, that was like seven or eight years ago. Look at it again. And I know I'm older for the character, right. but look at it with that in mind. And I did. I looked at it and I thought about the play and I thought about Lorraine sitting down writing that play. And like I approach all revivals, I said, what's going to make the play work for today? Mm -hmm. If Lorraine Hansberry was alive today, how would she write this play? And I said, so when she wrote it in 58, it was about a 30-year-old boy, mm -hmm. but with one chance, one dream. And now, in 2010, it's like, you know, 30 year olds they get more than one dream and one chance. So I thought casting an actor that was a little older made the dream seem more desperate, made it seem like you got one shot. And uh, I thought Denzel gave the performance of his life for that production. I was really proud of the production. Man say, I, I got to take hold of this here world, baby. Women say, eat your eggs and go to work. Man say, I, 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 I got to change my life. I'm choking to death. Woman say your eggs is getting cold. Walter, that ain't none of our money. This morning, I'm in the mirror, in the bathroom, I'm thinking. I'm 40 years old, I've been married 11 years, and I got a boy who sleeps on the living room couch, and all I got to give him is nothing. Nothing but stories about how rich white people live. Eat your eggs. Damn my eggs. Damn all the eggs I ever was. And I won a Tony for that production. <laughs> <laughs> but all that stuff is subjective, you know, because I look back sometimes at some of the most difficult. I would say that the 2004 production was more challenging because I had an actor who had never been on the stage before, you know, and I was putting Audra McDonald and Felicia Rashad with uh, Sean Combs, you know, so that was really challenging. Or, or you look at what I did this year with Children of a Lesser God. It's like to direct a play that has a third of the cast death, a third hard of hearing, uh, and a third hearing to have Asian Americans, African Americans, and white, and white Americans all in the same play, uh, to try to make it uh, uh, three-dimensional for the audience, that was a real, real challenge. So I would think that, uh, I would say that Children of a Lesser God is probably the m most proudest uh, theater moment for mm -hmm. me as a director. And then you worked with Denzel, of course, in Fences with the glorious Viola Davis. In what way did you alter their relationship in that, in that play? When I approached that, I didn't say, okay, they did this in 1987, remember when James Earl Jones and Mary mm -hmm. Alice did this play, and, and let me approach Denzel Washington and Viola Davis, and you know, of course, Scott Rudin is a great producer, he produced the show, and, and so, but when I look at it, I'm like, what could make, how can I find the truth of Troy and Rose through Viola and Denzel? Mm -hmm. And you know Denzel has a greater sense of humor than mm -hmm. James Earl Jones. You know uh, Viola has a, a, a grittiness and an earthiness about her and a truthfulness mm -hmm. that is unmatched. It's not easy to admit that I've been standing in the same place for 18 years. Well, I've been standing with you. I've been right here with you, Troy. I got a life too. I gave 18 years of my life to stand in the same spot as you. Don't you think I ever wanted other things? 
Does you think I had dreams and hopes? What about my life? What about me? What I think was great about our production was they each pushed each other. And um, um, I think Denzel will admit this. When he's pushed, he pushes back. And so when Viola pushes, he pushes back. And as a director, all I, all I have to do is keep encouraging the pushing. You say I take and don't give. Joy, you're hurting me. You say I take and don't give. Joy, you're hurting me. I'm going to give you everything I got. Joy. Don't you tell that lie on me. Don't you Joy, tell that lie on me. me. Don't you tell me about no taking and... Joy, no. Joy, no. Please, Joy. All right, see? That's strike two. In Samuel L. Jackson's forward to your book, Take You Wherever You Go, he describes you as an agent uh, for change. I'm reading what he said at the time. Mm -hmm. And one of your major achievements, of course, was changing the direction of the Alliance Theatre Company in Atlanta. And what, was, what, was your, what were your goals there? Well, that's got a couple of questions in there, uh, mm -hmm. things I would have to comment on. Number one, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, he agreed to do the foreword for my book uh, because I've known him for a long, long time. And he and his wife actually were my inspiration to get more involved in theater. I was a political science major, and I went to see a play that Sam Jackson and Latonya Richardson did on a stage called Dr. B.S. Black. And it was a musical, and they couldn't even really sing that good. <laughs> <laughs> but they were having so much fun, and I started thinking about that as a, as a profession, you know. And he has been that constant, authentic friend all of these years. Mm -hmm. So whenever I get in a jam or I need a professional opinion, I call Sam Jackson. So the fact that he wrote um, this book for me, I mean, did the forward for mm -hmm. the book, I'm, I'm eternal uh, grateful to him for that. Um, as it relates to the Lions Theater, that was a major uh, Lort Theater in the country. There were very few people of color running these theater mm -hmm. companies, and I was fortunate and blessed to run the Alliance Theater for 10 years. And um, I diversified the programming. I diversified the board. Uh, and I'm really proud of that. Some of that wasn't easy. Some of it was you crazy. Had some, you, you had know. some pushback. Oh, you had pushback. Well. You had death threats. You know, And I was like, wow, if I'm a director and I get a death threat, <laughs> what was Dr. King going through? So even back then, I had to be me. I had to represent who I was and uh, represent my strong uh, southern roots and, and understand that I am a lineage uh, that have people like uh, Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee and uh, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier. Um, and that's, got that's, big, that's uh, strong blood, you know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. it's part of my responsibility mm -hmm. to keep that going, uh, to behave how they would have me behave. Why did you leave the Alliance Theater and set up uh, True Colors? I, let up, I left Alliance Theater not knowing I was going to set up True Colors. Who would leave the big theater company to go to a smaller theater company? But I left Alliance, Alliance Theater Company because it was time. Mm -hmm. And I ran into a, 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 a CEO of the Reader's Digest uh, uh, Fund, and he had awarded the Alliance Theater a couple million dollars uh, for work in diversity. And I flew back with him on his private plane in New York. I had never been on a plane, a private plane before. And he says, so Kenny, this is year two of you at the Alliance Theater, big major theater company. What are you going to do next? All right, what do you mean? Um, uh, this is great. I'm making $250,000 a year. Um, one of few people of color running an institution. I got a good life. He said, man, I think every seven to 10 years, people should leave what they're doing and do something else. And that put the seed in my head. And so I left the Alliance when it was time, you know, and I gave my notice in year nine and left in year 10. And as soon as I left, I was offered two Broadway plays in the same year. I could not have done that if I was still with the Alliance. So every time I've changed directions in the road, it's always worked out. Tell us more about True Colors and what were your goals starting out and what are your goals today? Yeah, True Colors. <laughs> that, that's crazy because... I had no intentions of starting a theater company, and I had a, a, a gentleman by the name of Riley Temple who was running the board of directors at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., and he says, Kenny, we need a national black theater company, mm -hmm. and the only person who could run that is you. Mm -hmm. And then I saw uh, Chris Manos, who was over Theater of the Stars in Atlanta, and he says, you should start a theater company and stay in Atlanta. So I, I put those two ideas together, and as, as an experiment, 
I said, okay, if I were going to start a theater company, this is what it would look like. If I were going to start a theater company, it would have the name that really meant something. True colors, truth and clarity. If I was going to start a theater, it would allow me the flexibility to go away to New York and California and make great art and shine it back on the light in Atlanta and not be a prisoner of doing a nine to five in Atlanta. You had a close relationship with August Wilson and you write in the book, and I'm quoting you, that he and your grandmother were the most important people in your life. Can you uh, expand on that? What I decided was that everything that I've come to know in life, uh, I can trace back to my grandmother, mm -hmm. something she taught me or told me mm -hmm. or sang to me or something my mother said to me or mm -hmm. sang to me or something that August Wilson said or that is said in one of his ten plays. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. everything I need to know in life is reinforced from those three, mm -hmm. those three people. Mm -hmm. So we built the book around that. Mm -hmm. Before he passed away, Mr. Wilson asked you to direct uh, Radio Golf. First of all, August set out to write these ten plays, and um, I had acted in the ninth play, Jim of the Ocean. Mm -hmm. So I created the role of Citizen Barlow, and I'm forever grateful for August for providing that opportunity. And then I left the show, and then they kept developing it over mm -hmm. time, and Marion McClinton was the director. And then I would say a year and a half later, they called and said, mm -hmm. August called and said, uh, so we need you in Boston. Um, I said, like, what, what do you mean? I thought he needed me to act in the play in Boston. He said, no, 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 um, uh, Marion is not uh, feeling well, uh, so we need to uh, replace the director in the show, and so I need you to come to Boston, take over the show, and then take it into Broadway. I'm like, this is August Wilson, two-time Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> yes. writer. I'm like, August, I could never say no, but that's not. Yeah, I've only, at that time I had only done one Broadway show. So I was, I was like, I want to do this, but I'm directing a play in Washington, D.C. for True Colors, a, a musical of Tambourines to Glory. And it's at the exact same time. He said, we'll do whatever is possible to make that happen. So I just, out of stupidity, I just said, okay, yes. <laughs> I had like maybe two weeks to get it together. But I would rehearse Jim of the Ocean in Boston, right. leave rehearsal, get on a plane, <laughs> fly to Washington, D.C., and rehearse that group of actors for Tambourine to Glory. And then I would go to sleep in D.C., wake up the next morning, rehearse those actors, then fly to Boston and rehearse those actors. So I did that for like 10 days or whatever, and both plays turned out really well. And that's how I know that I can do anything in life. So by the time we got that to Broadway, um, before we got the reviews, August said, let's go, let's go have dinner. And we went to uh, the Edison. And he says, I've enjoyed this process. I really want you to do the last play, the 10th oh. play. And I was like, yeah. wow, I got yeah. to 10th play. You're asking me to do the 10th play in the cycle? And I said, but there's one thing. I just agreed to do Toni Morrison's opera. Um, and it's going to conflict with the time that you have to do this last play, Radio Golf, at Yale. So I went off to do Toni Morrison's opera, and then at opening, after opening night of Radio Golf at Yale, August called me and said, okay, um, that didn't work out like I wanted to, so I want you to come in and take over the show. Are you free now? I said, yes. And right around that time, he found out that he had the inoperable liver cancer, oh. and that um, you know, he wasn't gonna be able to see it through. Mm. But you know, we carried on a lot of conversation during that time and trying to get that 10th play right. The things that he gave me as an artist, and African-American artist specifically, I'll, I'll, I'll take to my grave. I'm forever grateful for him for, for the advice and for the work and for the friendship. Um, so I ended up doing that last play um, without August around, but we completed that cycle uh, of 10 plays, and I'm really proud of that. And I'm really proud that we have, an, you know, Jack Fertel made it possible for us to have the August Wilson Theater on Broadway, oh, nice. and I know August would smile like that. The True Colors program has, uh, I think it's the August Wilson monologue, the August Wilson com monologue, monologue competition. competition that I started uh, along with Todd Kreitler because of my, out of, out of my grief. I said, mm -hmm. August Wilson is no longer with us. How do we keep him alive? And we said, 
You know, like, you know how Shakespeare has those competitions? We can start an August Wilson competition. But we didn't have any money. I had a theater company in Atlanta. So we started in one school in Atlanta, Georgia. And now, 10 years later, we're in 13 cities. What was your best performance as an actor? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. A uh, play that I really love uh, a lot is a play called Sidsway Bonzi is Dead by Athol Fugard. Mm. Uh, I really love uh, performing his plays. I love the language. Mm. I love um, the content of most of his plays. Uh, so if someone wanted to get me back on stage, all they have to say, they would have to say it's just Athol Fugard. Mm -hmm. And then I did a play a couple years ago with my friend Felicia Rashad. We did the same time next year together. <laughs> and that was a beautiful romantic comedy that I love doing with her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just depends on the role. You were recently honored by the Actors Fund of America. It was you, Warren Beatty, Uma Thurman, and Cheetah Rivera, right. a wonderful group to be with. And you, you spoke very movingly uh, during your speech, mm -hmm. and we have a little bit of that to show right now. And many of us don't admit it, but none of us are gonna get out of here alive. <laughs> So it's how we live this life, how we treat each other, how we respect each other, and artists are the center of life. How will you encourage others, especially young people, to follow your example? You know, it's like the book says. The title of the book is, Take You Wherever You Go. And I think if you take you wherever you go, that's the best that you could do. The problem is we don't take us wherever we go. Sometimes we feel like we're not good enough. It's not enough, so we try to pretend or we try to be someone else, you know. Uh, I, I'm a kid that grew up poor in the South. I'm a young man that went to a historically African-American college. You know, I'm the director that worked with the homeless population on a play called People of the Brick. That's who I am. So what I'm encouraging everyone is don't get overwhelmed mm -hmm. by what you can't do. Just do one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you're upset with the political climate in the country, talk to your neighbor. So when I do plays like Children of a Lesser God, it's all about we need to listen. All of us need to listen. I have more than enough communication skills. You don't. They never did. They? Who's they? Hearing boys. They could never be bothered to learn my language. Oh no, that was too difficult. I was always expected to learn to speak, but I don't speak. So if I had to say one thing to America now, it's like, listen, and preferably go in a dark room, go in a theater and listen. In writing the book, did you recall events that you had forgotten about, but in, in the writing process, they came back to you? Oh, absolutely, in writing the book, you forget a lot. And in fact, you remember you, you may not remember it uh, the way it actually was. And that's what I realized in writing the book about truth. But yeah, some of it was hard, and I think the hardest thing sometimes when you say, well, I gotta have to talk about, these things may be uncomfortable to, Painful. to, mm. to, to certain members of my family. Mm. And then I think about, okay, I don't wanna say anything that's gonna hurt anyone. So I didn't. And everything has a good and everything has a bad. So every time I said something that could be perceived as negative, I found something that was positive in a person. And it's no secret that I think spirituality is the key to life. So I try to center things with that. And I think also we sometimes get full of ourselves and don't give proper respect to those who have lived before us. So I try to look at my mother, my grandmother, and um, all those great Americans that lived before me. Cause, so we all have to know that we're part of a process. And it will come a time when it's time for us to move on as well, like August, mm -hmm. August Wilson would say, it's like, I'm not afraid of dying. You gotta die to make room for somebody else. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, we all have our time. And it's how you, how you leave the place. Yes. You know, and you wanna, just like they said in the play, you wanna, like you write on a tree, Kenny Leon was here. <laughs> you know, you want, you wanna have some impact. You wanna know? leave and your mark. Wanna leave your mark, and while you're here, you wanna be relevant. Mm -hmm. You want to stay relevant, which is why when I was doing the Hairspray live musicals and the Wiz live musicals, I love working with those intergenerational groups of people because that keeps you relevant. One of my favorite anecdotes in the book is uh, Denzel <laughs> taking you to meet, without telling you, taking you to meet 
one of the legendary great actors uh -huh. of our time. Well, yeah, Denzel and I went to eat at the Beverly Hotel, I think it was. He said, I want to take you somewhere after, after breakfast. I said, okay, cool. So we got in his car <laughs> and we like went to this nice place. I had a little pool in the backyard and it was the home of Sidney Poitier. And he was like, Sidney's like, oh, come on in. I'm like, okay, I'm in the living room with Sidney Poitier and Denzel Washington. <laughs> You know, I know what my job is, to sit and listen. And I was like, that's Mr. Boyer, a man of class. And it's like, he's my kind of man, because he was authentic and he was truthful, and uh, he was great. You're surrounded by the memories of these incredible people. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm lucky. Mm. You know, especially with, I, I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida, on Mickey Sickey Road, you know, mm. on a little farm mm. with me and my grandma sitting on the porch with, uh, no indoor plumbing. Mm. And to make it from Mickey Sicky Road mm. to Broadway, I could only get there by taking me wherever I go. Mm. And um, it's been a blessing. In the acknowledgments in the book, uh, you describe your friendships with uh, Mr. Jackson, Felicia Rashad, and of course Denzel. Mm -hmm. Now, do you, rem do you remember what you wrote about Mr. Jackson? I would say, if I had to guess what I wrote about Mr. Jackson, I was saying he was probably that big brother that I never had. That's exactly right. And he <laughs> has always been there when I needed him. So I love him and his family. And about Felicia, with Felicia you wrote Forever My Artistic Soul. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, Felicia and I have sort of a shortcut when it comes to understanding how to create great art. You know, she can read my mind sometimes, and I can read her mind. And that makes it really easy for a director yeah. and an actor to work together. I want to do something with Felicia Rashad. Mm -hmm. And I'm always waiting to do something with Denzel Washington and Sam Jackson. And of course. I'd love to do something with Helen Mirren. That would be great. Perfect. Yeah. And speaking <laughs> of Denzel, in, in, in the acknowledgement, your, the wording was, always there. Whether it's on stage, in rehearsal, or just picking up the phone. He's always there, and I, I appreciate that, you know. Um, and you know what else I want to do? What? Now that you asked, yes. I want to do a big, nice musical. That was my next, Broadway. this That's is what eerie. I, want to do. I just said, why haven't you not done a musical? Because I haven't been asked. <laughs> well, I've done musicals, regional, <laughs> mm -hmm. regional theaters, but mm -hmm. I want to do a Broadway musical. I want to do a romantic comedy. I would love to do a musical about uh, the artistry of Michael Jackson. I like to do something on Prince. I like to yes. do one of those old, like, I can't think of something like Hello Dolly, but I want to do that too. Yeah. I want to do a big, nice musical. So talk to your friends, have them call me. <laughs> <laughs> what is your view of the uh, future for regional theaters since you were so much involved uh, and still are with True Colors? Um, I, I think um, regional theater, community theater, commercial theater, it's all tied up together. Mm -hmm. Educational theater, uh, I spent a lot of time in working with young people. So it's all tied together. So if, if the education of theater is healthy, if community theater is healthy, if regional theater is healthy, then Broadway will be more healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and right now I find that too many times we lean on the commercial part of the art. And um, I think we have to pull back on that some. I think we always are interested in involving our artists who are commercial to do the work. You want that, but you don't always want that to be the leading um, character trait for productions. Uh, and I think sometimes the regional theater can get thrown off because they're like, well, we need this star, this star, and this star to do this play. Yes. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. Regional theater was began because you wanted to get away from the commercialization of theater. You wanted to be able to ask proper questions of the community. And I think we'll have a, a, a healthy mm -hmm. regional theater mm -hmm. when, when, when that is more of the case, mm -hmm. when it resembles mm -hmm. more of the regional theater that was happening in the 50s and 60s, without going back to the 50s and 60s, oh. because we still have to encourage young writers, young actors, we still want to engage them. And we can't hope that they go off and become famous by doing a film, mm -hmm. then bring them back to the theater. Mm -hmm. We must do their plays when they write them. They're writing plays at 19 and 20. Do the plays, take a chance on them. Take a chance on a young actor, you know? Take a chance on a young stage manager. Um, you know, continue to communicate with 
all generations. In the process of writing the book, did you discover something about yourself or your family or what you do that was um, a little difficult to revisit? I would say 50% of the book was difficult to revisit. Mm. You know, before the book, everything was just in my mind. Mm. Now it's, now everyone knows <laughs> what I've been thinking. And it was great, I got a, 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 a note from my mother, and she hasn't been texting for long, right? But I sent her a, a signed copy, <laughs> advanced copy, and she, she texted me back, I can't put it down. <laughs> was there a show that you worked on that wasn't a great success and you were surprised that it did not succeed? Well, I've learned over the years to redefine what success means. Mm -hmm. So there are shows that are not going to get great box office. Mm -hmm. There are shows that may close before you want them to close, but that's not the ultimate definition mm -hmm. of success. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've changed the way I look at that. I don't look at box office to do that, even when it's great. You know, I look at what's the impact, who's being moved, who's coming to see it, um, what, young, what are young people saying about it, um, who is it touching, and I wouldn't change anything about them. Um, yeah. It's a good thing to say. Yeah, no, I can't believe I said that. How long did it take you to write the book? About a year. Mm. About a year, mm. yeah. A lot of conversations, a lot of writing, a lot of talking. Uh, you know, like being in therapy. It's certainly a wonderful book. Congratulations on this Thank book. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And uh, we, we want to see everything you're doing going oh, forward. Thank you for being with us and join us next time for Spotlight on Broadway.